Wait, is this just gate? Chapter 357 Written by Pepper Antique Vickers checked over his kit as he walked next to the other two Earth operatives. He'd done what he could to modify the uniform and gear to fit his new, larger, and more feline frame. But at the end of the day, even having a full set of XXXL gear sent over had resulted in his body straining at the very limits of the adjustment straps. Royal Tailors had at least managed to make the uniform itself passable, though he'd had them remove the sleeves of the jackets. The new rifle was the biggest improvement. Its official designation was the Browning 5 Malawian Quachars. But soldiers just called it the Par Deuce in honor of its venerable predecessor the M2. Like the original it was a .50 caliber. But it featured interchangeable furniture, firing controls, and barrels. Depending on the setup it could be used in a dual grip, vehicle or building mounted weapon like the M2, or as a squad weapon like the old 240s and 249s. There were even a few Spec Ops teams who had fashioned CQB versions. Vickers' former squad members had used that version on more than a few occasions. But right now it was in its sniper configuration, per his request. Features included a lengthened and rifled free-floating barrel, a 20-round UMAG, recoil-absorbing fixed stock, bipod, and a high-power multi-view scope. The scope was capable of being boosted to 50x magnification when used in conjunction with the glasses that Vickers had, modified into makeshift goggles, as well as having a vast suite of sensor capabilities. An attachment to the bottom of the stock actually allowed it to be placed on a flat surface, and remote-controlled by any interface linked to it. Vickers had it set up with his tablet and intended to use it to keep the rifle on target, as he tracked the team's actions in the upcoming operation. The program in it would link the two muck marchers' feeds so that he'd be able to triangulate targets, and if necessary send a round through a wall at any impending threats. Was it practical? Under any other circumstance definitely not. M5s like this had primarily been used as a proof of concept to sell them to the military. The handful of times they had been used in action they'd mostly been used to take down enemy vehicles and on a few occasions ordnance, before they could get too close. But Vickers had wanted one and his new physique had allowed him to use it as if it was a standard sniper rifle. His new size even allowed it to look like it was the proper scale comparatively speaking. Five had jokingly asked if he was compensating for something when he'd pulled it out of its crate in the summoning room. Then Vickers had pointed her at her crate and she'd shut up. He looked at them as they walked now, only a few yards away from the black-clad members of the king's military. If Vickers had run into Driscoll in a dark alley back on earth he would have been terrified of the man. At over seven feet tall and almost skeletally skinny, the Werfox cut an intimidating figure just by default. But with the dark orange goggles over his eyes and the long black cloak and black fatigues he was wearing, he looked like some kind of cyberpunk grim reaper. He was equipped simply enough, having opted to use Vickers' former assault rifle in its CQB format. Since the marchers weren't accustomed to unarmored combat Vickers had had them only equip magazine belts instead of full chest rigs. Until they could train more his intention was for both of them to keep their gear minimal and simple. They didn't have the muscle memory that allowed him to pull equipment from numerous pouches, belts, and slings without thinking just yet. 5. Was not intimidating. Not unless you were afraid of squirrels. Or discount ninjas. Like Driscoll, she wore a set of orange-lensed goggles. But where he wore fatigues, her new physique required that she wear loose-fitting black sweatpants and a hoodie until they could get something better fitted. She'd used black duct tape to tighten the clothes up in places where they were too baggy for her intended role. Tucked under each arm was a pair of semi-automatic pistols chambered in 5.7 by 28. Slung across her back was a trusty old Benelli M4. The plan for them was simple enough. Five would use her climbing skills to function as a scout and close-range overwatch. Driscoll would try his hand at leading a squad of Petravians into the buildings and securing the people within, and Vickers would be actual overwatch with his sniper rifle. He'd take position in one of the numerous guard towers throughout the city, in this case the one that was just on the outskirts of the refugee sector. With all the other buildings having been destroyed and then either rebuilt or replaced, it was now the tallest building in that area besides a stone church tower that was too central to give him good line of sight. 
the royal guards, being led by a handful of captains and more than a few hooded figures that Vickers imagined must have been the kings, agents, wore dark leather armor and black cloaks. Their faces had, where necessary, been coated in black and brown paint that reminded Vickers of the camo paint he'd worn on numerous occasions. And instead of their usual weapons, sported small buckler shields and short swords or clubs. The archers were all equipped with light crossbows and had been attached to small squads of normal soldiers. Additionally, each soldier, including Vickers and the two muck marchers, had been given sets of shackles and other various restraints. Vickers had also ensured that the three of them had tasers. Not that Vickers expected to even touch his once things started. That would imply that things had gone very very wrong. As the sizable force neared the castle gate that faced out toward the refugee sector a flare was launched into the sky by a crossbow. A few moments later three matching flare arrows shot up from the outskirts of the city, letting them know that the cohort's position there had spread out and were moving in. The idea was that they would begin shepherding people toward the castle, allowing them to be intercepted by the force Vickers was moving with. Mags would use special sensors to determine whether the people were under the effects of any mind-altering magics or creatures, and if they were they would be dealt with. Everyone else would be ushered to a series of staging areas where they'd be given refreshments and food until the operation was over. Vickers looked over as the Guardian barked an order and the small platoon of Petaravian riflemen, and a small detachment of normal soldiers, broke off and headed around the castle toward the barracks. Former Sergeant Batista accompanied them in a set of well-fitted Petaravian armor. Armor which didn't cover any of his prosthetic leg, which Vickers knew from experience was more dangerous without any padding. He silently wished them luck as he watched them depart for their objective. And also wondered when the king had approached Batista about getting involved. He looked over at one of the agents walking nearby, uncertain as to whether or not it was Teldra in the Spymaster, or Tels or simply some other faceless operative in the king's staff. Mind if we move up and get in position? He asked the agent. The hooded figure seemed to blur for a second, and Vickers sensed a type of magic unfamiliar to him. Then they nodded. Move ahead chief. They said in a raspy voice. Vickers turned his goggles on, thermal vision on one lens and light amplification on the other. Then he turned to Driscoll and Five, who were watching him. Leash is off. He said. Let's see how you two do. And remember the rules. Yeah yeah. Driscoll said as the three of them broke into a jog and began moving past the Petaravian soldiers. James walked into Steve's pen with a smile and more than a bit of weariness on his face. Under one arm he had his army bedroll and under the other he had one of his last few MREs. He had a bottomless bag full of food for Steve slung over his back. Hey boy. He said with a grin. We're gonna be roommates for. Oh. Probably a week or two. Steve looked at him blankly before sniffing at him a few times and licking at the bag over his shoulder. He and Amina had, understandably, fought a bit. It wasn't really a fight. In his opinion fights required two participants. And while James knew he was dumb. He wasn't so dumb that he thought he'd had any leg to stand on. So it had mostly just been Amina berating him and scolding him. He'd taken it without hesitation, and without even attempting to deny that he was in the wrong. Still, as he tossed a few carcasses that looked like massive, six-legged, toads to Steve, he smiled. Partly because he knew that whenever Elixir got back he would be getting an even worse thrashing, and maybe even an actual beating, from his sister. For the record, James didn't consider being thrown through a window as a beating. He'd had way, way, worse injuries since coming to this world. But he also smiled because of the good news he'd been able to give Amina as she'd kicked him out of their room for the night. First of all, Amina had succeeded in her goal to obtain a new, personal, griffin. The other riders had managed to wrangle it and get it into a pen until she could heal up enough to complete its bonding with her. But it was, for all intents and purposes, hers now. And it was a rare variant at that. Not as rare as Steve was among Drake kind. And its coloration and size also made it somewhat impractical in certain combat situations. But it would still be a prize animal in any part of the world, an amount worthy of royalty. But that wasn't the real reason James was smiling as he laid his bedroll down so that the top of it rested against Steve's third side. 
he patted the massive beast on the side of his neck as he continued munching on the toads cautiously, clearly unfamiliar with the creatures himself. You're gonna have a new family member to look out for Buddy. He said happily, causing Steve to look at him curiously for a moment before getting back to his meal. The healer that had cared for Amina after he'd caught her had also been the keep's primary fertility priest as well. Before he'd left the room to come down here, James had given Amina the news, causing her to freeze midrant as she heard it. You're gonna have a little girl to help us take care of soon enough. He said as he pressed his face into Steve's fur and hugged him. I can't wait for you to meet her. I know she's gonna love YA bud. Then he leaned over towards Steve's face, ignoring the toad gore caked on it now. Maybe when she's old enough we can track down one of you and Maxwell's kids for her. Get her in the clan too. He said conspiratorially, though he doubted Amina was anywhere nearby to hear it. Steve's head cocked to the side and he actually paused his eating at the sound of his former mate's name. But he quickly went back to his food again. And for the millionth time now James had to wonder just how smart the massive reptile actually was. But that was a question for another day. James sat down with his back up against his best friend's side and popped open the main pouch of his MRE. Tonight's cuisine was Salisbury steak, easily one of the worst MREs he could have grabbed. Yet as uncomfortable as his current room and board was, and as monumentally pissed as he had made his wife only a few hours before, James continued smiling from ear to ear. 